episode of PPENY, an educational video series where we get an introduction to the Ethereum improvement proposals, upcoming features, upgrades, and basic of Ethereum blockchain. I'm your host, Pooja Ranjan, and I'm joined by Colfax and Nolan from the ETH Staker community. In this episode on the Beacon Chain, And benchmarking, we will have an overview of the standardized metrics, interoperability, and the importance of these metrics for Altair Upgrade, along with uh, the resource analysis of consensus client. To talk more on this, I welcome our guest, Paritosh, a DevOps engineer at Ethereum Foundation, Leonardo Gomez, a researcher at Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Thank you for joining us. As I understand, uh, we have a presentation coming up and I'm looking forward to follow that. But before that, uh, could we have just an introduction and a little bit about how you joined the Ethereum community? Anyone can go first. Leo, do you wanna wanna start off? Sure. Um, Okay, so hi, thank you for the invitation very much, uh, Pooja. And um, yes, so my name is Leonardo Bautista Gomez. Uh, I'm a senior researcher at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Um, I usually do research in high performance computing, uh, supercomputers, uh, in the subjects of uh, fault tolerance and uh, reliability and scalability. And since uh, 2018, more or less, so about three years ago, I started to be interested on, on the scalability issues in blockchain technology. And uh, at some point, I decided to um, join uh, a little bit this effort on uh, bringing blockchain technology to the next level. Uh, so I started to be involved with the Ethereum Foundation and to do research uh, supporting the development of the uh, Ethereum 2.0 protocol. And so, yeah, uh, that has been uh, more or less three years that I've worked with the Ethereum Foundation. And, and today we're going to present some of the results that we did uh, that we got over the last uh, year. Thank you. Hi, I'm Paritosh, and I pretty much started with Ethereum around um, around when I was doing my master's. I was looking for an idea for my master's thesis and decided to deep dive a bit into Ethereum there. And subsequently, when I was looking for my first job, I decided to work at a blockchain-based startup. Um, at some point last year, I, I remember seeing a tweet from Justin from the Ethereum Foundation that they were um, hiring a lot of new people for the ETH2 team to help support the efforts there. So I decided to throw my hat in the ring. And since then, I've been working at the, as a DevOps engineer at the Ethereum Foundation. Thank you. Thank you so much. This introduction, like every individual had some encouraging story. I love that. OK, uh, so without further ado, let's peep in. Cool. So um, starting off, uh, hi, I'm Pai Um I'll be talking about metric standardization today. Um, to, before we begin, what are metrics in itself? Well, metrics are quantitative um, assessments that you can use to track how something is performing. When you're able to track them, you can use these to influence your future decisions, to track changes, to see if any changes you made actually worked. Um, a, a very common form of using metrics are time series metrics, so data points that are collected over time intervals. A simple example for where metrics can be useful, you can see a graph of um, internet traffic in my household. So if I have to upgrade my internet, I would have I would be able to see this graph and see if I'm hitting the bottleneck and know that I need to upgrade or not. Um, Prometheus is an open source monitoring tool. It's one of the most famous in in the monitoring space, at least. Uh, It's part of the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And the reason this is important is that it has a lot of integrations with other Cloud Native tools. It makes it extremely interoperable and easy to use and plug in. Some of them that you might have heard of would be like Kubernetes and orchestration engine. Um, It also has a query language built on top of it to help you make sense of this data. It's super, it's relatively efficient and it ha- gives you a lot of options for scaling and configuring it in different um, manners. Grafana is a tool we use for visualization and Prometheus has great integration with Grafana. So you're able to collect your data and you're able to visualize it. And Alert Manager is another tool built by the team at Prometheus that can be used for getting alerts from, from this data that you have. All of this is quite simple and easy to set up and use. 
just to give you an example of how such a workflow might be, um, say I have a device that has a certain amount of memory, that would be my data source. That's how the data source is exposed to Prometheus that is collecting this information. Grafana can then be used to visualize this information. In my case, that 88% of the disk is full. You could then use alert manager to define alerts. I've just omitted the expression so that it fits in the image, but um, you could define an alert that fires when your host is out of memory, for example. Uh, this alert can be broadcasted by different methods. Uh, one such method is what I've shown in the image, which is pager duty. You could also get notifications via telegram, email, SMS, whatever you configure it to. So this is pretty much how a metric setup might look in in the in any any world actually any computing system now coming to ethereum itself um, currently all the production ready clients um, support prometheus metrics which is a great start they can all be plugged into the same infrastructure and they would all be able to expose the same type of metrics you're able to collect the information in the same way this should enable easy migration between clients without too much of redevelopment of your metrics infrastructure. But there's still some parts that are missing. For example, the metric names don't always match between clients. So this becomes an issue when you want to create generic alerts that apply over all clients. Or if you have a dashboard, you wouldn't be able to use the exact same dashboard if you were to switch clients. So migrating away from a client has a lot of friction because you might have to redevelop your alerting, you might have to redevelop your dashboards and maybe even change some custom tooling that you've built. A standard for such metrics would help reduce the friction. So you could have shared dashboards, just build once, use always. You could have shared alert rules so the community can define what they think is a good alerts and share them and you don't have to worry about which client you have but rather just be able to use them um, for example if you're a larger staker you could reuse the same monitoring tools even if you have customized ones across the clients and allow you to actually have multiple clients running in your system um, all of this is better for client diversity in the long run because it allows you to plug and play as you need and naturally, individual clients um, can still have their specific um, metrics that can be their value add-on, that can be what they entice their customers with. Um, in order to achieve this, um, we wanted to look at a standard set of metrics. We just began with something called a minimal metric set. Um, the way we chose this minimal metric set is Leo's team um, created, painstakingly created a really big table where uh, they log the current status of everything. So we looked at the metrics that require the least amount of effort from all the client teams, but were still important, and chose those as the minimal metric set. So we want to first achieve interoperability between this, this set of eight metrics over here. And the hope is to grow the set of metrics to, I think the second version has another 30 or 40 different metric labels that we want to standardize on. Um, and we want to have a really robust set for most general use cases to be covered. Um, again, I want to reiterate, this doesn't mean that everyone has to follow the exact same rules. This isn't like a spec, but rather um, like a guide. So you could have something that's easier to begin with. Um, just to give you an example, I took a bunch of the um, uh, Piermont nodes that we run. Um, this is the latest version on all of them. And as you can see, using the same label, um, there's not always all the client metrics showing up. It's also not defined. There isn't one client missing in all of them. It's a complete mixed bag right now. We're hoping that over the next couple of releases that at least the minimal metrics that will be standardized amongst all clients. And we've already, um, we're already quite far ahead with that. And just to put this in some context, why is this even important for Altair? Well, if you have metric standards, it makes it a bit easier to track how the network is evolving and how the health of the network is to begin with. You could have a lot more um, network level alerting that you can implement. So you know it isn't necessarily just one client that might be down, but rather no 
uh, be able to scrape a wide variety of clients and be able to decide that the network itself is healthy or unhealthy. Um, client -like, um, consensus layer client diversity is still not as robust as we like it to be. Um, so a standard in this sense might make the change easier. It might entice at least some solo stakers or large stakers to move away from what the setups they have right now. Um, and also as, as the consensus layer becomes more important with Altair and the merge, we need to ensure that we can have an easy setup. And one of the things that makes setups difficult is for people to have extremely specified uh, pre-knowledge, right? It would be much nicer if we can just find a solo staker and say, here, there's a shared dashboard, this will work irrespective of what client you use. Um, and that being said, I'd also like to take this opportunity to just tell you how standardization could work. Maybe someone amongst you has an idea for some other area that needs to be standardized. Um, have a look at how the current state of things are in whatever you're looking at. Tables really help. The tables that Neo's team made were amazing and super useful to figure out how we need to proceed to begin with. Compile this information, make it easily accessible. A uh, couple of places you could bring up discussions are the ETH research forums, ETH RD Discord, GitHub, maybe even Twitter. Uh, pre present your issue, try and engage with the client developers. And if there's enough buy in, um, try and find a point of contact from each team. Bring these points of contact together and try and broker a discussion where you can agree as a community um, as to what the standard needs to be to begin with. If the community needs to be involved, involve the community as well. Um, it helps to track the changes by creating new tables at this, at this stage to see the current status and what changes actually need to be done so that everyone's in agreement again. And either you convince the client teams to implement these changes or you can support the project and try making PRs yourself. Um, this would just be a standard way on how you could go about standardizing anything in the space. Looking forward to more ideas there, of course. Um, and with that being said, I'd like to hand over to Leo so he can show you what you could do once you have nice metrics in place. All right, uh, thank you very much, Pari. Um, yes, so I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about uh, benchmarking and uh, the resource analysis of the consensus clients that we did um, uh, last year. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, my students, Mikel and Luca, for this work. They did most of the, of the big effort here, so um, I want to acknowledge this. Um, so uh, to start, um, I think uh, I want to make a, a disclaimer. Um, first, that uh, all the results that I'm going to show over the next 10 minutes um, were done over the Atlas net, um, not the Ethereum 2 mainnet. Okay, so this was done about uh, a year ago. Uh, this is these are not uh, numbers or figures that will represent uh, the Ethereum 2 network today. Okay, so this is the first disclaimer. And uh, the second uh, thing I want to mention is that most consensus clients today have a new version, a completely different new version with different characteristics, and they probably do not behave in the same way that they behaved uh, one year ago. So uh, some of the maybe bugs or, or, or weird behavior that I will present here probably um, do not represent uh, the current status. Although some of those uh, might uh, still continue um, uh, as well. And basically, the main message here is that um, the, really the purpose of this uh, talk is to show the importance of benchmarking and, and metrics and have uh, common metrics um, across clients rather than uh, comparing uh, one client to the other. Because as, as I said again, uh, this was uh, done a year ago with very different versions of the clients. So with that said, um, the goal of the study was to analyze the resource consumption, the computer resources that each one of the consensus clients uh, use. So we use the five clients, uh, Prisp, uh, Teku, Lighthouse, Nimbus, and Lodstar. And we mainly look at four different metrics, uh, which, which were uh, memory consumption, uh, CPU usage, uh, disk usage, and uh, networking, so network bandwidth. Um, and I will not have the time to present all of them here, uh, but I will focus just of, on a few ones and some of the interesting findings that we did. 
um, uh, with, the, with this. So for example, when we look at memory usage, um, we see, for example, those, there are some clients like Teku and, and Prism that uh, use much more memory than other clients, uh, for example, like Nimbus. Um, is, it, and this is actually uh, the case more or less today. Uh, if you look at the, I will show some figures uh, later on. Uh, some of these behaviors still uh, present today. Uh, Teku um, Java virtual machine does consume a significant amount of memory, um, while Nimbus is a much more um, lightweight in, in terms of memory usage. Uh, we do see, for example, there is a, a weird pattern here when Lighthouse increased the, the, the the amount of memory it uses. And I will come back to this later, uh, to, to, to this behavior, because it, it does show some interesting thing that was that were going on uh, on the network um, uh, at that time. Now, when we look at uh, CPU usage, uh, we see that, um, again, uh, there are two clients that uh, do use a lot of CPU, uh, Teku and Lighthouse, um, or at least they did at that point in time. Uh, Prisma load start uh, usually stay around 50% of CPU usage. And again, Nimbus show uh, rather uh, low uh, resource consumption uh, in, in this case, uh, most of the time under 50% of CPU usage. Um, one thing that we can see again here is um, that uh, around hour 23, so here uh, the X axis is the, uh, is the time and the Y axis is the CPU usage. When you see close to hour 24, so we run this uh, in, in for about 48 hours, all the clients. And by the way, I, I just forgot to mention that they were all running in the same node, in the same spec. So there is no uh, difference on the on the hardware for, for, for them. Uh, what we see here is that there is a drop in CPU usage um, for uh, Lighthouse uh, for several hours. It was basically uh, kind of dead. Uh, I will come back to this in a minute. Um, if we move to the next um, uh, metric, uh, disk usage, we see again uh, this behavior around hour 20, where there is the, the disk usage kind of skyrockets uh, for Lighthouse, and it reaches uh, uh, 30, about 34 gigabytes, which was the maximum that we had in the virtual machines that we were using at that moment. And then it flats um, uh, out, and it kind of uh, just to stay there. That is exactly when the CPU usage drops to zero. And the reason is basically uh, the client could not continue syncing uh, because it has used all the available disk uh, in, the, in the machine. So it's completely normal that we see the disk usage um, uh, flattening and that the CPU uh, usage drops to zero because there is nothing else the client could do. Um, but when we look at this usage, was not only Lighthouse who behave um, uh, strangely. Actually, if you look at uh, Teku at our uh, maybe five, there is also kind of a spike. Uh, there is the, the, this orange line. There is a, 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 a kind of outlier here. And if you look at for, uh, a Nimbus also, uh, there is a clearly uh, sharp and increase sharp increase in in this usage after uh, hour six. Um, and again, for lot star, there is also uh, a significant difference at some point. Uh, now, you might think that they, they are not synced, like uh, it's first Lighthouse, then Teku, then lot star, then Nimbus. But actually, this is because we were running the, um, the clients, uh, the different clients at different times. Now, if we sync them all uh, with respect to the slot, so if you go to the next slide, um, when we sync this um, disk usage by the slot instead of time, of, of wall clock time, you will see that the change in behavior happens to all of the clients at around slot 70,000, more or less. And you see that at this point, all of them, uh, Lighthouse, Teku, Nimbus, Lotstar, etc., they have a completely different um, behavior in terms of disk usage. Okay. So um, in addition to that, when you look at the chain synchronization um, between slots 70,000 and, and 100,000, um, there is also quite a increase in, in a speed, a change in, in the speed of synchronization for all the clients, which actually matches this um, uh, segment here where this gives a change for all the clients. Now, what was happening then is that we had a non-finality period on the Medalla testnet. And this was because of some um, uh, bug issues that one of the clients had. 
uh, with respect to timings, uh, and I, I'm not going to get into the details. But again, uh, the important thing here is that we we run into a non-finality period. But what is remarkable to me uh, from this experiment is that we actually could observe that just by looking at the resource consumption of the clients in uh, your uh, hardware. So uh, for me, this was a completely you know unexpected result because I was not. Uh, thinking that you could actually observe uh, the consequences of, um, you know, uh, protocol issues in the blockchain in when you look at the resource consumption of the clients. But of course, in retrospective, it does make sense that uh, when you have a non-finality period, then uh, you cannot prune. And if you go to the next slide, you will uh, see what I mean. Um, this is these are the log events uh, for one of the clients uh, for Lighthouse. And uh, what you see here uh, for in, the, in the figure on the left uh, is uh, the number of uh, times a block is queued. And please note that the y-axis is a logarithmic uh, scale, okay? So it's not a linear scale. So you, most of the time you will have between uh, one and, and 10 uh, blocks queued. Uh, but then at some point, when this is when the uh, non-finality period started, you will have over 200 blocks will be queued uh, at the same time. And then basically zero for a long period of time. Okay, so this is completely abnormal behavior, and this is this, this reflects clearly the non-finality period that we we had uh, on the Medellin testnet at that point. And when you look at the figure on the right, uh, we look at different events on the on the logs uh, of the of the client, and you see that several events just stopped happening. So, for example, database pruning. Uh, extra proning, starting the database proning. So all these events just didn't happen at all. And the reason why this proning did not ha did not happen is because this is done after you reach finality. So when you don't, you don't reach finality, basically um, they never happen, and then that's why your uh, that's when your this consumption explodes, and basically your at some point your client kind of dies because uh, you have used all the resources available in the system. Um, so um, this was kind of an experiment uh, for us to see, just uh, curious to see, you know, uh, how these uh, different resource consumption are between clients. But again, uh, what was surprising for us was that we could actually observe um, the consequences of non-finality in uh, resource consumption. So I think this kind of uh, highlights the importance of, um, you know, uh, benchmarking and monitoring and having uh, common metrics between clients because actually we can observe much more things that uh, what we one would expect. Now, when, when you you look at the clients today, um, we still monitor them and the pictures, the figures that you see here are uh, basically figures uh, that show the memory usage and the use usage of the clients today running on the mainnet. So you see, you know, we we don't see all the weird patterns that I just show. Uh, for the Medalla testnet. But we do see, come, uh, however, some um, differences between clients that is still uh, important, right? We, we still see, for example, memory consumption is high for Teku, is low for Nimbus. Uh, we see disk usage is high for Lighthouse, uh, particularly low for Nimbus again. Uh, and you, you do see some patterns. Um, so there are some differences that are still important uh, between clients. And so we, we, we still monitor this uh, um, today. And, uh, and if you want to do it yourself, actually, um, you can. Uh, so we have uh, made uh, these resources available online. You can just go to this repository. And it's just a very simple Python script. Uh, there is no you know, rocket science behind. It's basically uh, uh, just a script that is monitoring the resource consumption of, of a specific uh, process ID that you pass on uh, a parameter. Uh, so uh, I want to you know, make mention explicitly that this is not going to release any information about your validator or, uh, you know, the status of your validator or your <clears throat> beacon node or whatever. Just, this is just basically monitoring resource consumption of a Unix process, okay? So this, there's absolutely no information that is going to be released uh, for your validator. So if you want to try, go ahead and try. You will see that the output of, the, of this uh, monitoring script is what you have seen, you see in this, in this figure. Uh, it's a CSV file that you can then plot. Uh, we offer also a, a plotter tool so that you can easily plot uh, the data and see how this uh, looks. So uh, I encourage all of you to uh, who wants to try, just go ahead and, and, and go to the repository and give it a try so that if you are running nodes, you can you know 
maybe uh, monitor their resource consumption and perhaps you can even set some alarms uh, in case something will happen or, or something like that. Um, yeah, and so though I think I just want to end up by um, saying thank you to the Ethereum Foundation and the Barcelona Supercomputing Center for their support on, on this work. I think uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. It was really thorough. I, I really enjoyed it. Maybe because I have a soft corner for data and chat and that was also very well presented. First, I would like to open the floor for the panelists uh, here to go ahead with questions uh, if they have any. Yeah, I thought of a few questions uh, throughout. The, first of all, I just want to say awesome presentation, guys. It's really cool to see what you guys are doing with the metrics and then like the aggregated metrics on test nets and whatnot. It's, uh, it's really cool. Um, I thought of a few things. I guess I'll start off with maybe the simplest one. So I like say I'm at home solo staker, maybe moderately technical. Um, I see this video, I want to set up metrics. Now I set it up. Like, what do you recommend I do with the data? Like, should I check this dashboard like every day? Should I set up some alerts for myself? Like just as sort of breaking the barrier into looking at these metrics, what should I do with the data myself? So one of the nicest things is um, alerting for me, especially as a home staker, you might want to know uh, when your disk is full, if your bandwidth is being hit, if your um, nodes are not syncing anymore. And those are relatively easy alerts to set up, hopefully in the future, also compatible alerts across clients. Um, and the next step would be whenever you're thinking of upgrading, for example, um, either for your hardware or for software or for any particular reason, have a look at the dashboards for us. Um, see what they are or perform the upgrade, have a look at what it is, um, especially if you notice something irregular, it's also great to notify the client developers then. I may, maybe just to add uh, on top of, um, of what uh, Pari just, uh, just said, uh, maybe just looking at the metrics can help you also decide um, which client fits you better. Uh, if you want to compare them, you know, you just run, uh, I don't know, one each week and then uh, you look at the metrics and then you can decide what is, what is the one that fits you better according to your needs. Yeah. Cool. That's helpful. Um, on the topic of standardization of a metrics API, I understand you guys have worked with the metrics APIs of many different clients, all of them, it seems like what's the current state of the metrics APIs across clients? Like how far are we from a unified standard? Like, is it totally different? Is there like maybe 50% overlap or what does it look like to you guys? Leo, maybe you want to take this? Yes. Um, so at this point, um, as Pari mentioned, we have a minimal set of uh, metrics that we want to be standard across our clients. Um, this is just a set of eight metrics and uh, not all of the clients have released, I mean, have adopted this standard yet in their last release. So uh, all, almost all of them are in the way of doing it. Uh, we just did uh, a cross check across, you know, uh, across all clients uh, this week, um, looking at 32 different metrics. And um, there is a lot of um, there is a lot of differences between them. Uh, the names are very uh, well are different. Uh, there are several metrics, actually, most of metrics I think, that are not supported by at least two of the clients. So they have like uh, you know different sets of metrics each one of the clients, and um, there is no like a very clear intersection. Like uh, okay, this one is this group of metrics has, is really supported by all of them. Um, so I guess, uh, I think our approach will be to try to expand this minimal set of metrics by um, slowly introducing those metrics that are already supported by three or four clients and uh, that, you know, to impose the least uh, overhead on the client developer teams, um, because of course they are very busy with other things. And so basically what we are trying to do is to find those intersections and, and try to prioritize those that are already almost, um, almost there. There is also some metrics that are uh, implemented by uh, all of the clients or some of the clients, but with significant different, with some differences. Like um, they, they mean the same thing, but they are implemented in a different way. And um, so we have to look at these uh, small differences and, and to make it, uh, you know, um, standard so that you can 
actually set up a dashboard that looks at all different clients at the same time. Cool, that makes sense. Um, and so I guess that just immediately brings to mind, I mean, this isn't our first time coordinating or are collectively in Ethereum coordinating clients communicating. We have like the existing sort of ETH1 um, execution layer clients. Like, has there been a similar conversation on the historically, like on the, I guess, ETH1 side? And how do they solve um, it, I guess? I'm actually not sure if they've had such a conversation on the ETH1 side yet, um, because most of the ETH1 clients don't necessarily speak the same protocol to begin with, like someone, one of the clients might be using InfluxDB, the other one might be using Prometheus and so on. So I think, met, I feel like they have a decent overlap in terms of metrics themselves. You might need a bit more configuration to get it there. Um, but the ETH2 scenario is actually quite healthy from there on. I guess, because we started later on, there was early agreement as to cool, everyone's going to use Prometheus. Um, and at some point there was a divergence. So we're trying to bring that back together. Yeah. Exactly. And I, I want to yeah emphasize over what Paris said that uh, the fact that we are starting now so early in the development of Ethereum 2 is really a, a good thing. You know, it's, it's really something that will allow us to have something uh, in the future that is uh, very standardized. If we had started this, uh, I don't know, in one year or, or two years later in the future, it would be, of course, a much harder effort. So I think this is why it's important to not let this go now and make an effort now when it's easy, because later on it's going to be much, much harder to implement, I think. Well, yeah, I totally agree. I'm glad that this is a conversation now so early on in the development process. Um, I have a couple more questions on like aggregate metrics, but I don't want to hog the spotlight. I guess, is, does anybody else have any questions they want to ask? Not really a question, but more like a, um, a proposal um, to help this uh, effort get along. We know that like writing documentation is like the most hated job in development, right? <laughs> so, and I see that with the EVE2 uh, RPC API, um, there's already like a spec out there, even we, for the metrics you don't, or you guys really don't want to do a spec, um, but having, or well, something that's always difficult in metric land, especially with Prometheus, is to know what a metric actually means. Um, what it says and what you should look for. So um, I propose that with all the basic set of metrics that they are well documented and maybe um, as a second step also get uh, already created alerts and good explanations, what they mean, what you should look out for. Um, this could, in my opinion, um, drive the client development teams more into this because they don't have to provide documentation for their metrics because they can just like point to like the generalized spec. Um, so it's less friction to just follow the standard than to come up with own metrics and have to document and explain them yourself. Um, and speaking as a as someone who's involved with Lido staking, it's also very important for the for the big stakers um, that we can diversify clients with like as little as effort as possible. And monitoring is a huge part of the operation because like a home staker can look at like the client log for like one key or two keys. Um, we are running like thousands of keys and you can't look at them individually, you have to look at them aggregated. Um, and you have to have all the automatic alerting for those to see if one of your nodes or one of your uh, validators goes wonky. Um, so yeah, it's super important to, to have that on that side as well. Yeah, definitely agree with that. Um, Maybe that's also a good idea to have some dashboards as in the in the spec repo or whatever we have as a spec repo as well, so people can already import it and start off from that. And totally agree with the alerting as well. It might be nice to have some alert templates and maybe bounce those off along with uh, spec descriptions. 
Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah in, internally, we do have um, a spreadsheet uh, that we share with uh, all the client teams. So as, as Pari mentioned, we have select, we have ask all the client teams to select one person that will be kind of in charge of this standardization process. And we have a Discord uh, group where we all um, exchange uh, information and we discuss about what exactly a metric means. And so we have this spreadsheet with all the metrics that we are um, standardizing with a full description of the metric. And so I agree with you, maybe the, the thing is that right now is just a kind of private document where we are working uh, together, but I think we should, we should make this public at some point so that uh, it's, it's clear for all the community uh, what each metrics actually means. Well, I think that partially answered my next question that I was about to ask. It was about resource monitoring that you mentioned in one of your slides that there are, you know, sample and people can DIY and have that done. Uh, am I uh, correct to assume that there is no public dashboard for all clients as of now that people can go and refer to just like Explorer or something? Um, I'm not sure if one such dashboard exists. Um, Maybe there's a community created one that I'm not aware of, but so far I've relied on either the dashboards the clients themselves provide or ones that I created myself. Yeah, I, 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 will, I will agree with that uh, because I, yeah, I haven't seen any. Uh, I know that we run our own dashboards and we try to plot all different, all five different clients in, in our dashboards, but uh, yeah, I haven't seen a, um, a public one yet so that's why we offer this kind of do-it-yourself uh, kind of tool uh, so that people can start looking at it but yeah that being said we definitely add that to the list of things that should happen as a push towards the merge have easier setups for monitoring easier setups for dashboards and working right doing like a diy is good but if there is something like people can refer to would always be helpful yeah thank you definitely on the topic of collaborating or cross validators, um, in that sense, like I really like the analysis you did with the aggregate data from Adasha. And I understand how difficult that kind of thing is probably for mainnet because there's obviously like data privacy needs and don't want a doctor validator and everything like that. But like, are there any aggregated data endpoints that stakers can send their data to to sort of create like an aggregated dashboard? And so we can get kind of an idea of like, what nodes are operating like under the hood of actual main net Ethereum and maybe use that as, I don't know, like leading indicator for like either client issues or turbulence on the beacon chain or something like that? We don't. Um, we don't have this, but this is, is, is a really good idea um, to set up endpoint uh, so that uh, validators can actually uh, share this information. It's definitely something that we have in our agenda. And uh, it's not it's not um, existing yet, but yeah, this is something that uh, that we want to implement. Um, one of the issues then would be, um, you know, uh, how to motivate participation into this, and how how reliable are the conclusions you can draw from this, given that this is you know voluntary participation. Um, but I think um, even though you will have some maybe statistical issues uh, looking at that data it's much better to have that than to have nothing. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's going to be useful. Uh, so yeah, we are looking into that. Definitely. That's a great approach to like donate your data to help, help the network. Yeah, cool. Thanks. So I have previously installed Prometheus and Grafana on the test nets and all that. And it's not extremely difficult, but it's also not extremely easy. Is it going to be possible or is it on the roadmap to basically make some sort of a script that you can do, you know, a pseudo app get install ETH2 metrics versus installing Prometheus and Grafana and hooking them up and pointing them towards the clients? Is it going to be possible to just make that a one click sort of thing? So one of the things I'm working on is open sourcing a lot of the um, Ansible playbooks that we use in the DevOps team in the Ethereum Foundation. So Ansible is another such automation tool where you can just say, point that server, tell it what to do. Um, you just have to do some initial setup to configure where that server is. 
Um, and once such a playbook is actually set up the entire metrics infrastructure for you. So it would be as simple as saying Ansible playbook, um, a file that says where the server is with the IP address and which set up metric playbook. And then you would have meta, uh, you would have a Grafana instance with a dashboard and so on. Um, we have a preliminary version of this open sourced already, but we're still making that a lot nicer and maybe some blogs will follow to show people how to actually use them. So that I hope would be the easiest approach. Amazing. Yeah, that would definitely help um, get more people using metrics. Mm -hmm. So I have maybe a follow up of uh, what uh, Colfax asked earlier uh, about the standardization of metrics. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to understand the trigger point when the Beacon Chain team or the devs uh, who, uh, who were involved in the development of this chain started to look into it because I'm aware like there was no such precedent in ETH1 clients, right? So. Um, so, well, um, I, I think, well, I think Pari has a lot of experience uh, fighting with dashboards uh, for the test nets. Um, in our case, um, we, we were just interested on, on analyzing how the different clients behave and, and um, just benchmarking them and uh, just document the, the, the differences. It was just a very, just a simple research kind of investigative investigative approach. Uh, but then when we started that work, uh, we started with Prometheus and Grafana and, you know, we ran into all the issues that, uh, you know, just Nolan, Nolan just mentioned. And then um, we noticed that they were just completely different metrics. Uh, and uh, we started to try to make sense out of them and, uh, and try to aggregate them in some, uh, in some way. And we open sourced this table to the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, we shared this document with uh, with Danny and, and and others. And I think at uh, that point, I think is that we realized that um, yeah, there is uh, it's really hard to make sense of any data, uh, given that they are all reporting different kind of things. And so I think uh, that was the moment that we said maybe we should do something about this. Um, and then I guess afterwards uh, when we. Party was started working with Desnets. Uh, he also realized that that was uh, very difficult, but I would let Party talk about that. Yeah, exactly. So I helped set up and manage a lot of the validators for the test nets, um, especially if we want to test, for example, the Altair update. We did a lot of dev nets, and metric dashboards are one of the easiest ways to get this aggregate view of how the network is looking. Um, and I think the more test nets that were set up, the more important it became and such a push became more and more important. So I guess that's one of the driving factors. I know there used to be a, a, a metrics repository, but I'm not sure when that started, um, but it wasn't extremely live. So what we did was sort of bring it back to life and try and push the efforts a bit more. And, and how often do you find like uh, an individual client metrics that can be added for standardization? Like, is it a, like very frequently or you think that you have achieved to the state of a standardization for a set of metrics? Um, I think it's an ongoing process. So currently we're still um, trying to facilitate discussions on the next set of metrics um, to also get people to agree on what the metric has to mean. Um, and so on. And we always use Leo's, uh, Leo and his team's earlier research as a trigger point. We try and see, okay, cool. So three out of the four clients already agree on what this is. Maybe we just have to convince the fourth one that they also should agree or all three change because the fourth one had a better reason, whichever, whichever one it is. We just want to facilitate that discussion. And usually we use that as a starting point and then go downwards. So easier to harder at least. But um, but to add on that, I think basically the philosophy at least from my side is that the more the better, the more data points we have, really the better. So uh, my my dream would be really to have hundreds of data points uh, in which all of all of clients can report uh, the same thing, and I think that would be really beneficial. I'm, as a scientist, I I love data, so I think as much data we can get, 
<laughs> the better. So I would really uh, always, so as, as Patty says, it's an ongoing process. And I think the objective is to reach as much data points as we can so that we really can see uh, how the network is behaving and, and understand what is going on. That's interesting, yeah. Normally, when you have this kind of system of monitoring uh, for a company specifically, you have, like, I mean, you guys mentioned um, meter duty, for example, and it kind of uh, indicates, like, that there are fires or people need to fix fires. Who fixes the fire in Ethereum, or is this in particularly related to um, the clients? Well, um, that's relatively laborious. It depends on where the fire is to begin with. Um, if it's a client bug, then the client needs to issue an update and we have to convince the community as a whole to update as well. Um, and that, that includes educating and getting the word out to as many people as possible. If it's a specific validator or an operator, if or a larger staking service that's down, then the trick is identifying patterns and seeing who's down and trying to book them and say, hey, it looks like you guys are down. Maybe your monitoring stack didn't pick it up, but the network's unhealthy. Could you help us out here? Um, another location where that might be interesting is, uh, is when we're testing out hard forks, like the Altair hard fork, for example. Um, we noticed in one of the dev nets that peers were going, like the EF nodes were losing peers. So that led to, uh, you, you try and bring a couple of client teams together, collect as much information as possible, who's losing peers, why are they losing peers, what peers are they losing, and then work backwards to see, okay, is there some pattern that emerges? Is there a certain client that's um, doing something differently? Um, we actually had this in one of the tap nets where we were able to figure out that there was a, um, expectation of a different implementation. So one of the clients was downscoring another client more than what they should be because they both thought of some concept differently. Um, and the trigger point was that we were losing peers and that's easier to see if you have aggregated metrics because you can't make that assumption from one node. You need to make that assumption from a network view. So to an extent, or, um, is what you're building here similar to um, I, mean, I don't know if you've worked with tools like, from, like Datadog, for example, or just basically like a tool um, that provides insight into like the, the general behavior. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it's uh, an, a combination of a large manager, Prometheus and Grafana would achieve the same thing as what Datadog is doing or a similar thing as what Datadog is doing. Um, the major difference is you have to self-host or you can self-host Prometheus Alert Manager and Grafana um, and all the data belongs to you. Versus with Datadog, you have to probably go into a contract with them and figure out how things work on their system. So I think we briefly touched on the uh, that Pratter um, testnet uh, thing that uh, the analysis of sync committee performance on Pratter testnet, the chart that we saw recently. Um, so I, I'm just trying to understand how was the experience debugging clients with those colorful charts? Would this uh, standardization of metrics play any role in that or it was just uh, separately, I mean, not connected? So the Prata debugging for the sync aggregate stuff um, was nothing to do with the metric standards at least, um, mainly because that's still extremely new stuff. And I think Proto wrote really cool tools that can generate those fancy graphs that are really detailed. Um, maybe in the future, we also have metrics for that so that everyone can use them, but not right now, at least. All right. Yeah, I have one last question, but before that, sure. if anyone has any other question to go ahead. Okay. so. Um, my last question is about the resources, like what would be the best place to follow a metrics and benchmarking? I remember you mentioned about the GitHub repository where metrics, whether is it still existing or has it changed or any other place where people can find? Um, so you could have a look at the Ethereum Foundation organization. 
Um, I would hope that in the future we'd be making a couple of blog posts on the topic, um, maybe tweet about it. But currently the metrics repository does exist. Um, the current standards are pushed to that repository and most likely we'd be updating that with example dashboards and example alerts or maybe have a separate example repo in itself. Yeah, and, and to complement that, I think we are uh, we're gonna do some um website or I mean web page that kind of explains uh these uh, yeah. metrics are a bit more in detail uh as um, it was mentioned earlier uh in the mega labs uh website um, so i think we're going to try to also aggregate a, a lot of the information about metrics uh, the standard association uh, in that in that website to complement the, the repository that's going to be helpful i hope so we talked about client diversity. We also mentioned it in our previous call with present folks. Uh, we have Nolan here. Uh, post the discussion with the present folks, uh, the Eats Taker community came up with some surveys. So uh, Nolan want to speak with that? Yeah, um, let me share my screen if possible. Um, but yeah, we um, have been working with Xiaowei from the Ethereum Foundation to um, create a survey can you guys see that so we are pretty close to releasing this i think there's just a few things with the website that we would just want to make it a little bit prettier looking and, and nicer but basically we're just trying to get data on um, people that are already running nodes people that are using staking services and people that maybe are interested in staking, but haven't made the leap yet. So you can see uh, we start like getting some background information, figuring out how experienced they are in the Ethereum world. And um, we ask them if they're a solo validator, if they're using staking service or they're not staking at all, depending on their answer there, they go to uh, different sets of questions. And we're just uh, looking to collect some data, figure out what pain points are, um, figure out you know what software people are using what hardware people are using and then um, asking for feedback on that so we're like asking to rate the interface user experience and the community support of like the launch pad the deposit cli um, things like steakhouse waigu if that's what they used um, and just figure out what's the biggest pain points and you know where we should focus efforts on making things better so uh, and then with the staking service we're figuring out you know which staking services people are using um, and which ones are good which ones are bad which ones are performing well and finally for the non-stakers we're trying to figure out um, you know what's preventing them from staking and what can we do to get them involved and help continue to decentralize Ethereum. So we should be ready to release this, I think in just a few more days at the most. Um, it's just a little issue with the website that we got to clean up, but um, look out for us. Um, and we look forward to hearing everyone's responses. Thank you. Thank you for that. While we are on this topic of client diversity, I'm just curious to understand uh, your take. Uh, maybe anyone can go first uh, on the new client joining in at this time, Grandee. Uh, do you think it's going to make some major changes or uh, how good or bad it is for the overall network? Well, for now, it's closed source. So it's hard to recommend that anybody uses it uh, for mainnet, um, but the East Staker community did a call with Solius from there. It seems that they have good intentions and they're um, just doing their best to make a good product, but for now it's closed source. Um, I think they just have some issues with um, investors and uh, they got a grant, but they can't make it open source and all that. So un until it's open source, I, I can't really recommend anybody uses it, but I'm looking forward to 
them sorting out their issues and getting it open source. And then, yeah, I mean, obviously having more clients is awesome. Yeah, I think one of the differences I heard from from them is that uh, they they did a, apparently again it's closed source so we don't know but apparently they did a, a good job at uh, paralyzing some parts of the uh, attestation um, verification process and so that really kind of speed up um, the, well, the the client in general and so yeah that that looks very interesting and if we can if we can look at this uh, at some point in the future that would be great. That being said, let's also not forget that uh, Lodestar is now production ready. The first couple of midnight validators on Lodestar here. So we have another production ready client um, already amongst the mix. So feel free to test that out too. Yeah, that would be great. Recently, I found a guide like which was uh, talking about like uh, migrating from uh, Prism to different clients. I, I hope these kind of resources are going to be helpful for uh, new users or maybe to the existing users. So as fascinating as the world of data analysis is to me, I also think it is important to share what's going on behind the scene to uh, let community know how hard developers, researchers are putting into. And this will not only attract brilliant mind, but I assume that it's going to make Ethereum the most transparent and decentralized blockchain. We appreciate all the hard work put in by DevOps team, the research team, and the implementers team. Once again, uh, congratulations, Leo, for the acceptance of the paper on E2 Network Crawler at uh, IEE Estonia conferences. Thanks. Best research for the presentation. I hope the presentation is tomorrow, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yes. Yeah, all the best. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So it's time to wrap up. Uh, any final word, any final question, comment, anyone would like to add? That's about it. <laughs> well, thank you. Again, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, uh, Pariteosh, Leo, Cold Pass, Nola, and Anita, and everyone joining us and making this episode more informative. And a huge thank to our YouTube viewers for watching this episode. If you like this episode, hit the like button on your screen and share it with community members. We want this information to go out and reach as many as community members of Ethereum. They know, they participate, they interact, and that's what our goal is. Subscribe to Ethereum Catalyst YouTube channel for meeting and educational resources. We'll be back with another interesting topic for you. Till then, keep watching, keep sharing your love with Ethereum Catalyst. See you soon. Have a good day.